Okay. Yeah, we'll start. Yeah, so uh, Nikita Shirakov will give us uh, perspective on using XDP in production at Facebook and uh, let us know how that went and uh, <laughs> what kind of experiences they had and uh, what we can learn from. So uh, off you go. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nikita. I'm working at Facebook traffic team. And this talk is about XDP, our operational experience, and what we have learned by running it in our production network for one and a half year. So even if this talk is going to sound like a, like a narrative story, the actual goal here is to show how the BPF infrastructure could be used to build network application, and at the same time to share our experience to like running XDP on a large scale. So talking about uh, operation experience, we have plenty of that. Since the May of 2017, every packet toward facebook.com has been processed by XDP-enabled application. Which one? It's our layer for load balancer. It's open sourced. It's on the GitHub, the forwarding plane. Uh, this is not the layer for load balancing talk. So if you wonder like why we're doing that and how we're doing that, there is a separate one. But for this talk, this is basically what you need to know about layer for load balancer. It's a black box. It receives the traffic from the user. It's a stateful service. Uh, it has a like, state table, um, five tuple as the key, destination as the value. If you have a hit in that table, you know where to send the packet. If like, there is a miss, there is additional logic, which update this table, and in the end, you send the packet to the backend. Um, in our implementation, we're using uh, encapsulation. So packet is, when it's being sent to the destination, is IP and IP encapsulated. So why? Why we have decided to build something on top of the XDP? Well, everything started in October of 2016. Like if you didn't follow the news about the networking, this is basically when one of the biggest botnet has been revealed, the Mirai botnet. Like there was one of the biggest attack around that time toward one of the news website. The size of the attack was 600 gigabits per second. But if you're running like stateful service, you like automatically multiply this number by 1.5. And this is basically how you how many packets per second you will get on your stateful service if that was the TCP SYN flood. So around that time for the load balancing, we were running IPVS and like with our day-to-day -day, uh, traffic patterns, we were like more or less happy with IPVS. But in the end we have decided, hey, let's profile IPVS under SYN flood. So we built our test lab like one server, like multiple cores, multiple gigs of memory, multiple gigs of network connection. Um, we're running IPVS there. Second server is we were using for the, as a traffic generator. We were using like slightly modified version of the package gen from the Linux kernel. The only difference that it, like we teach it to generate TCP SYN packets. So SYN flat basically means each packet is uh, have unique source, unique source port. Um, clone zero in packet gen implementation. And the idea is that every new packet force IPVS to create the new session. So we start to profile, and this is what I have seen. Uh, cores which are responsible for the RQ handling was completely packed. Um, why? Uh, and turns out like to bring down this like huge expensive server, you just need like small server is one gigabit connection. So <laughs> IPVS under flat is like not fun to operate. Anyway, uh, why? Well, IPS is stateful service and turns out like create the new connection is super expensive. This is the part where people are usually decide to like rewrite something with kernel bypass, such as like NetMap or DPDK. But we have Alexei working with us and we have decided to go another way and basically build something on top of XDP. So when you start to like write something with a new technology, first thing first is like you check the documentation. Fortunately, like documentation about XDP around that time, um, basically there was like no documentation at all. Luckily, Alexei was working with us, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't scale. Uh, <laughs> not every company could have like Alexei working with them or Daniel. Uh, so if you think about like single slide from the whole presentation, which you need to remember this one, documentation measure. Uh, luckily today we have this awesome documentation from the Cilium folks. And if you write something with BPF, this is like first place to, to start. So anyway, we started to look into BPF infrastructure to figure out like what is missing, what we need to add there to build our load balancer. So first thing first, encapsulation, right? Um, we receive the packet, we do the encapsulation. 
the way XDP was working around that time is that it allocates per page per packet, but it writes packet in the beginning of the page. And as you can see, there is like not a lot of headroom for the encapsulation. So Martin came up with the idea, hey, uh, let's change something. Let's start a uh, packet on specified offset, and, actually, and also let's add the helper, which would allow us to uh, move the pointer to the start of the packet. So we start, uh, this is how it starts to look like. Uh, you start to write on the XDP packet headroom offset. It's by default, 256 for most of the drivers. As far as I remember, for Intel, it's like 192. But anyway, with BPF helper, uh, just head helper, you can uh, move the pointer. You have the headroom for the encapsulation. You're good to go. The next problem was that how to implement this stateful table. Um, you can do like hash table. Uh, but with hash table, you're kind of forced to have some separate thread which are going to iterate over the hash table to figure out like if the uh, state is expired or not. Um, the other solution, which Joe mentioned yesterday, is to use LRU. And basically, LRU is that type of map which would automatically evict the entry if it's not being used. Unfortunately, there was no LRU around that time. So Mark, oh, sorry, this is how can you use BVF I just had. Uh, anyway, unfortunately there was like no, no LRU around that time, so Martin was forced to implement one. <laughs> and as usual, there is like multiple time. Uh, same map could have multiple flavors. The regular one, single key, single value, works great as long as you have like single writer. Doesn't scale if you have multiple of them. Um, second flavor is per CPU, single key, multiple value. Each CPU could write to the dedicated area. But unfortunately, for the load balancer, you want for every CPU to have the same value. So there is lot, not a lot of benefits for us. So Martin add the special flag for the LRU, uh, BPF no common LRU. An idea is that you have this huge LRU. Every C CPU could look up through the whole map but it writes only to the CPU specific area. So that's give you the ability to single key, single value, and at the same time to be uh, friendly if you have like multiple writers. So um, looks like we had almost everything. We start to look what else is missing. And this is actually like tip and lesson. It's like the biggest benefit of the BPF is that uh, it's highly programmable. Like, and most performance benefits are going to be because you know your environment and where your program is going to run. For example, David was talking about how you can uh, use forwarding table from the Linux kernel, but in our scenario, we have like server, single interface connected to the layer three top of drag switch. Basically, you don't need to do IP lookup at all. Like there is going to be single entry, like send everything to default router. So what we were doing is just like rewrite the destination MAC to be the MAC address of the top of drag switch. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, um, kernel side was like more or less ready, and it took us some time to implement the user space helpers and like our application. And around the January 2017, we had the initial version of our load balancer. So again, same uh, lab environment: server, traffic generator. We start to, start to send traffic. Sin flood, more, sin, more traffic, more traffic, more traffic. We send 10 times more compared to the IPVS. And as you can see, we still have like a lot of headroom. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, why just 10 times? Why not to send more? Well, basically, um, this is another lesson or tip, like profile everything, right? Um, before with IPVS, uh, CPU was a bottleneck. Now something else became a bottleneck in our environment that was a specific uh, model of the network interface card. And basically, like, if someone tell you that, hey, this is like, say, 40G NIC, it doesn't mean that you can reach that uh, bandwidth with like 64 bytes of packets. Why? Um, basically, because like NIC is doing a lot of stuff as well. Like RSS, it needs to parse the packet. Um, consumes like some uh, cycles on the NIC as well. Like V4 versus V6, like 
Usually to parse with V4 packet is like more expensive from the Nix point of view compared to V6. Surprisingly, like TCP is kind of slower than UDP as well in terms of like packet per second. Um, the biggest problem here from my point of view is that um, nowadays like Nix are kind of black box. They have this bottleneck, but you don't know where it is located. It would be nice if something like ETH2 would be able to like tell you, hey, this uh, NIC is running on like 50% of capacity. There is no such thing today. Like the only way you figure out like that um, you reach this limit is like then when you suddenly starts to drop starts to drop like millions of packets per second. But anyway, um, this is what we get. As you can see, some CPUs have usage around 15%, some of them around 45 Well, why? Um, this is how the topology of the servers were, looks like. Basically, it's two socket servers, two NUMA domains. And the way we configure the RSS on our NICs is that we have single ma mapping between receive queue and the CPU, but it's configured in a way that half of the CPUs are on the NUMA node 0, half of them on NUMA node 1. But default BPF's behavior uh, is that BPF will allocate all the maps on the same NUMA domain as the user space. So as you can see, half of the CPUs kind of forced to traverse the QPI link for the map lookups. And because of that, they have like most, most all cycles and higher CPU usage. You can see in NUMA CTL, like yeah, one of the node allocates more memory than another. And when we start to profile, well, it's a stateful service, hottest functions related to the LRU housekeeping, basically to update the LRU when you create the new entry. Um, for fun, same profile, but without BPF no common LRU flag. As you can see, like now you have this uh, low contention. Uh, going back, uh, uh, state related routines. So we decided, hey, let's run the same stuff, but in stateless mode. Uh, this is how the same program looks like when it's stateless and doesn't try to the LRU at all. Why? Um, well, because aside from that LRU, which is kind of big, the other BPFs map, maps are small and cache friendly. So all of them could be located yeah. in like layer, two and layer, layer three of the CPU. And you don't need to go to the main memory to read from them. Um, perf, when it's stateless mode, Fun fact, around that time, BPF doesn't work well with perf. So this cleanup model is actually the BPF program, but somehow in perf output, uh, perf showed some random symbol from the kernel. <laughs> anyway, um, because when we were like running on multiple cores, we were saturated by the hardware. To get the baseline, we run the same test, but on like scene flood on the load balancer, but like only with a single core to get the baseline. Doesn't matter what the number was, we'll use this as just a relative number, uh, relative data point. So some uh, tips which we find when we do the initial deployment. Well, JIT is your friend. Around that time, by default, JIT was disabled and I, multiple times after the server restart, I saw that like performance of the program goes down by four times. It like, took me like multiple minutes to figure out what's going on. Then I have realized, yeah, JIT was disabled. I re-enabled the JIT. Performance was still bad. So like, <laughs> you need to restart your BPF program if you enable the JIT. Um, I think like nowadays it's uh, enabled by default and you cannot disable it after Spectre V2 <coughs> mitigations. Anyway, another stuff is that um, our monitoring system was using the counters from the kernel, but because XDP was working before kernel's TCP IP stack, uh, we had some situations when like load balancer was doing like million of packets per second, million gigabits per second. Uh, but from the monitoring point of view, it was looks like that it doesn't do anything at all. So yeah, don't forget to implement the counters in your application and don't forget to change your monitoring system to look into that counters. Um, someone asked yesterday, like, uh, how to do XDP program chaining. And basically, current limitation uh, is that you can attach only single BPF program to the interface, XDP program to the interface. So what we came up with is uh, with like super small and dummy BPF program, which being attached to the 
uh, ETH0 interface. And the way it works, it has a uh, BPF program array, and the only work which this small program is doing is um, it's check if there is something registered in the position zero of that array, if it's there, pass the control flow to that BPF program, that BPF <coughs> program like runs some logic, doing the same stuff in the end, check if, like, if someone is registered in position one, position two, three, four, if nothing been registered there, it's just build the default action, and in our case, it was XDP pass. Um, example, as you can see on the left side, this is how the root BPF program looks like, it's super simple. On the right side, this is how every program must end. Uh, in that example, the program on the right was registered in position zero, so it internally knows that it needs to iterate in the program array from position one and onwards. Um, next stuff is that, well, you run something with XDP, you need to debug and troubleshoot. So TCP dump works in kernel's TCP IP stack, XDP dump, XDP works before kernel's TCP IP stack. So we can uh, came up with like super unique and original name for our like troubleshooting tool. <laughs> Uh, we call it XDP dump, and the way it works, it's like create BPF program with BCC, with the help of BCC on the fly. It creates some filters. If there is a match, it will send first n bytes of the packet through the perf pipe to the user space, and user space will uh, read from that perf pipe. As example, you run the program, and it works with the help of like this root rootlet program root array. So it install itself in position zero, so it runs before any other XDP application on the same host. So as you can see, you can specify a filter. Um, it will print like five tuple on the CLI. But most important stuff here is that the same program could write the output to the file in pickup format. So you can use the regular tool for the offline uh, processing. Anyway, by the May of 2017, we have deployed um, this load balancer everywhere on our edge network. And this is where we are today. And basically this time we spent to figure out like what needs to be improved and what could be improved. So evolution, right? Um, yesterday, like people show you this insane numbers, how well XDP works when you like don't touch packet at all, <laughs> which is sounds great on the paper, but it's super unrealistic in the real world. So in our uh, load balancer, we have around six array lookups, around three hash table lookups. Um, so Alexey came up with the idea how you can do in verifier, basically how to remove one of the interaction. Uh, we did the perf testing, get plus three percent compared to the previous version. Um, sounds great. Then we start to look into, hey, how we configure our network interface card. So we have this one-to-one -one mapping between the receive queue and the CPU. So basically we know uh, every CPU number which is responsible for the ROQ handling. But the problem with BPF uh, per map, uh, per CPU maps, is that uh, by default, BPF will allocate some area for every CPU in a system. But if you have number of receive queues uh, less than number of CPUs, you have this uh, allocated area for CPUs which are not responsible to, for the packet forwarding. So we started to think like, what if we could uh, somehow allocate memory only for the forwarding cores? Uh, Martin came up with the idea of BPF map and map. So basic, basically BPF map and map is a special type of the map which where you can use like index or whatever you want is a key, and the value is going to be pointer to the another BPF map. So we know which CPUs are responsible for the forwarding. So the way we're using that is like we have the BPF helper which allow you to uh, get the number uh, CPU ID, you use the CPU ID as a key, and you, uh, the program will return you the pointer to the CPU specific value map. Before, after, we get three gigs of memory back from each of the server, pretty great. Starts to do the same test as before, Synflat. As you can see, like there is some improvement in numbers. Um, 
starts to look into profile, local NUMA node, um, BPF program, like perf starts to work with BPF. <laughs> anyway, uh, as you can see, BPF program first on the first place, uh, rough spin locker IQ safe. This is basically what the uh, LRU update is on the third. Um, on remote NUMA node, like more or less the same, but rough spin lock, uh, you can see it in output more often because it like have more stale cycles, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, starts to compare performance, plus 10 person, person compared to the previous version, plus 14 compared to the original one. And then um, we did a lot of changes in XDP, in XDP program. And it was like really painful to test them. So basically you need to set up again like your server, physical server, physical client, client sends something to the server, send server replies, you compare it like reply to what you want to see. If it's the same, you pass the test. Super manual, super hard to automate. Worst case, if you like messed up with your BPF program, like that server would be completely locked down and you need to power reset it. So we start to think like, hey, it would be nice to have the, some kind of unit testing with BPF. And Alexey came up with the idea of a special parameter for the BPF syscall, BPF proc test run. And the way it works is that you already have your BPF program loaded somewhere. In the syscall, you specify the descriptor of, the, of that BPF program, um, where to get the data, input data from, where to write the output data. You run the program, program write the output to the location of the memory where the data output pointing to show you what the return value of the BPF program was, like XDP pass, XDP TX, XDP something. Somewhere in your user space, you have the memory chunk with like packet, or with the memory, how the packet supposed to looks like after the BPF program test run. If they are the same, test is passed. If they are not, bad luck. Uh, in our scenario, as an input, we use base64 encoded packets uh, with test description as the output, uh, XDP return value, and again, base64 encoded packet. We did this for every possible code pass in our BPF program. And we have this unit testing framework. If everything is green, good to go. If something is red, you need to rework this part. And you can like run this in automated, auto automated way. But going back to our XDP program and XDP environment, um, this is how it was working, but in ideal world, this is what you really want to have. So the remote NUMA node will have LRUs allocated on the same NUMA node as the CPUs which are responsible for the RQ handling. So this is where Martin came up with the idea that, hey, let's specify the NUMA hint during the BPF map creation. Basically, when you create the BPF map, you want, uh, there is a field where you can specify, hey, I want to create this BPF map on that specific NUMA node. Before, as you can see, NUMA node zero have all the memory after <coughs> the BPF uh, NUMA, NUMA hint, they became more or less balanced. Start around <laughs> perf testing. As you can see, like not using remote NUMA node helps a lot. Uh, starts to run uh, perf test again. We get plus 4%. But this was always running on the local NUMA node, so this like great improvement in performance, like not really visible here. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, XDP plus fragmentation. So problem is that in XDP context, you cannot fragment the packet. But we could end up in situation when, receive, when we receive the packet from the user, and after encapsulation, it was bigger than MTU. So what usually people are doing in such scenarios is that for internal network, they just increase the MTU everywhere. And if we're talking about the Facebook's network, you can divide it into two segments. One of them is like point of presence. This is like clusters which contains multiple racks located all over the world. And they are not that big. So it was kind of easy to schedule a maintenance there and increase the MTU size everywhere. But at the same time, we have our data centers with millions of servers. And this is not as easy in terms of like changing MTU compared to the point of presence. <coughs> so we need like some temporary solution for that. So I came up with the idea with um, BPF XDP adjust tail helper. 
And the way it works is like more or less the same as XDP I just had, but it just, instead of pointer to the beginning of the packet, it allow you to move the pointer to the end of the packet. And that help you to create the ICMP message. So basically idea is pretty straightforward. You receive the packet from the user or from the client, and you realized, hey, after encapsulation, it would be bigger than MTU. So what I really want is I want somehow to signal the sender that, hey, you need to send like smaller packets. So this is where ICMP packet too big uh, came into the picture. And the way it's created, it using the some first end bytes of the packet, which triggered that message as a payload. So basically with XDP adjust tail, uh, you can shrink the original packet. Then with the XDP adjust head, you just create the ICMP header, IP header, um, MAC header, and send this ICMP message to the user. The way it being used is like more or less the same as uh, XDP adjust head. You can just specify how much you want to shrink the packet. So everything was great <laughs> <laughs> until <laughs> until we start to build our kernel with Red Alliance, where every, <laughs> every indirect call became super expensive. So we start to run like the same test as before, single core, send as much as possible, uh, TCP sin flat, boom. Oh, no. <laughs> Compared to original version. So yeah, luckily for us, Daniel came up with the idea of like inlining not only lookups, which already was inlined for us, but with updates as well. So after Daniel patch, we Still better than the original version. <laughs> so, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> um, this is nice to have features from my point of view, and I'm mostly working on the load balancing stuff. So, I'd really like to see somehow uh, to be able to use TCP checksum and offloading from the XDP context. So, today we're using IPMP encapsulation. But if you want to use something like, I don't know, VXLAN uh, or UDP-based encapsulation, uh, basically you cannot do that from the XDP because UDP requires the check summing across the whole packet, not just the header. The other interesting stuff uh, is that like nowadays, like almost all new protocols are built with security in mind. So almost every field is encrypted. And from the load balancer point of view, it would be nice to be able at least to like decrypt, say, eight, 16 bytes, some specific header, which could be used for the routing. For example, quick connection ID. Today you cannot do that. And also it's like super hard to do the TLV parsing from the XDP when you don't have support for the loops. So for example, it's hard to parse TCP options from the XDP. Yeah, I wish I had more time. There is like, Numerous improvements in like verifier or C-Lang parts. There is like the way to use BPF proc test run for the micro benchmarking. Um, Alexei did like BPF function calls, so it's like much easier nowadays to write uh, C program which would be uh, translated to the BPF because in the past when the clunk wasn't able to have like enough registers, it starts to do the register spilling but at the same time, Verifier didn't like that. Anyway, there is a way, and this is why I want uh, bounded loops. So there is like some experimental patches we have internally to create the Shin cookie from the XDP context. And it works like super fast compared to the original kernel. But again, um, without uh, bounded loops, it's hard to pass the TCP options. So yeah. So uh, one thing that's interesting to me is like you say you need you would like to have transmit checksum offloading, right? Yes. <clears throat> so in the context that you're operating in, you, you have a packet already which presumably has its own pre-computed checksum that is correct or not correct, but you don't care, you're, you're, yeah, you're balancing, yeah. right? If you encapsulate, the inner packet's <laughs> checksum is zero. So do you understand that? No, not really. <laughs> That if you if you check some over a packet that has a checksum computed already, oh, yeah. the result is zero. Mm -hmm. So you only need to compute the checksum over the headers, which is relatively cheap and can be done in software. And we can make a BPF helper for that to kind of like make that encapsulation system uh, situation possible. I think yeah. we use a similar trick for uh, doing a tunnel encapsulated GSO. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, actually, I haven't thought about that. We already have the helper which can do the BPF checksum in XDP context, but it's kind of limited. It can do only 512 bytes at once, and it must be uh, like the power of like four, two, I think. Like it I must think be it, like divided by four. It might work because you only need to do the headers from. Yeah, I, I haven't thought thought about that. So that's it's, a possibility. Yeah, I just want to point that out. Um, any questions for Nikita? What happens if the uh, client doesn't take the ICMP message? Bad luck. I mean, like, usually they do, but if they are broken, they are broken. And luckily for us, uh, the way the ICMP message was, uh, it, for the external clients, we don't do that. We only do that from the, when, inside our data centers, when the client is, is also controlled by us. So we can control the client, and usually we also have like TCP, PLP, MTU uh, enabled. Basically, this is like uh, MTU on the TCP layer. So it doesn't form a denial of service because you have more control over the client. Like for the external users, we don't send this ICMP packet to packet to big messages. Anyone else? Hello. Hey. Yesterday, um, they, sh they showed some performance figures when you received the packets and basically dropped them. So what type of performance figures did you get with all those hash lookups and array lookups? Um, there was a number from the Intel yesterday. There was the numbers in the XDP paper by Tokyo. So the truth is that it depends on the NIC hardware. It depends on the CPU, and it's yeah, you can check uh, Tokyo's and Jesper's paper on the numbers. I can't tell them, so sorry. Yeah, I was just going to answer that. We actually took the open source version of uh, your load balance and ran as part of the paper. So we have those numbers. Go check out the paper, it's pretty good. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm surprised like IPS numbers in that paper. Most <laughs> likely you didn't do the flat stuff. They are way too good. <laughs> All right, thank you, Nikita. Thank you.